we destined to destroy each other? Or can we change who we are and unite? Is the future truly set? Okay, X-Men Days of Future Past. Been looking forward to this one. It's a superhero movie. Of course I've been looking forward to it. But anyway, uh, I guess before I start talking about this, I should at least briefly tell you what I thought about the previous movies. Uh, the first X-Men movie, I will say I have not seen it in a long time. It's It's been a few years, I think, since I last saw it. But, you know, when I last saw it, I really liked it. Um, X2, same thing. I really like that one as well. X3... I can't really say I hated it. But it wasn't very good. <laughs> they did a lot of things wrong with that movie. Um, but yeah, it's... It had a few good moments, but for the most part... Um... Then we had X-Men Origins Wolverine, which just sucked. Uh, then what's next? Then we had First Class, which I thought was really good. I liked that one. Uh, then we had The Wolverine, which, uh, eh, was okay. And then that brings us to Days of Future Past. And in this one, which is set... At some point in the not-too-distant future, insert MST3K joke here, uh, mutants have been hunted to near extinction by these giant, ugly robots called Sentinels, which are these super-powerful creations that are capable of adapting to pretty much any mutant superpower you can throw at them, and therefore against the X-Men, they are damn near invincible, and they have no way of stopping them. And so a small group of what little is left of the, uh, the X-Men and Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants have joined forces to form a resistance movement, although it's not so much a resistance as just trying to stay alive. Um, at some point in time between movies, Kitty Pride has developed the ability to uh, telepathically link with someone and project their consciousness back in time to a previous version of their body, like a few days in the past, so they can go back in time with the knowledge they already have and warn someone when the Sentinels are going to attack so they can move on to a new location before they even get there. And they figure if they can use this ability to project someone back even further in time, perhaps they can stop this war with the Sentinels before it even starts and prevent the extinction of their race. Because through their study of history, they determined that the one event that was kind of the turning point that set all of this in motion was an event that happened back in 1973, where Mystique assassinated Dr. Bolivar Trask, who was responsible for creating the Sentinels. And she was hoping that killing off the Sentinel's creator would stop the Sentinel project entirely, but instead it had the opposite effect, and the U.S. government saw the mutants as the threat that Dr. Trask believed them to be, and that just put everything in motion and eventually led to all the mutants getting either wiped out or enslaved. Unfortunately, the toll that sending someone back in time takes on the body and on the mind is very nasty, and it's dangerous to send someone back more than a few days or maybe a couple of weeks, if only they had someone who had a much stronger than average body, someone with highly high regeneration capabilities. Oh wait, they have Wolverine. So they send him back in time and he has to meet up with the past versions of Charles Xavier and Eric Lencher and get them to unite and team up to stop Mystique from assassinating Dr. Trask and stop this war before it even starts. And that's the basic story. Uh, if you have read the comic, which I actually have, oh, big surprise, a comic I've actually read, yes. Uh, yes, I have read the original Days of Future Past story, and the comic book purists out there will probably notice many, many differences. Um, in fact, this is a very loose adaptation. Uh, basically, Sending someone back in time to stop an assassination that leads to the proliferation of the Sentinels and the end of the mutant race. 
That's about the only similarity right there, just that basic premise. Um, virtually everything else is different. I mean, in the original comic, you even had a different set of surviving mutants. Um, really, there were only six. There was Wolverine, Kitty Pride, Colossus, Storm, uh, Franklin Richards, Rachel Summers, and Magneto. I said six. It's actually seven. Math is hard. Sorry. <laughs> um, and in the movie, you don't have Franklin or Rachel, and you do have Professor X, Iceman, Bishop, Blink, Sunspot, and Warpath. And those last four are, I'm pretty sure, all newcomers to the franchise. Uh, they haven't been in any previous films, at least not that I can recall. And really, they're just there to show off their cool powers and fight off the Sentinels. There's no character development there whatsoever, which... Honestly, in a movie that's based around the X-Men, that's probably going to happen at this stage because there are just way too many goddamn characters in this movie and they're not all going to get enough time. And unfortunately, the story kind of suffers for that, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, another big difference is in the comic, you may recall, Kitty is the one who goes back in time and not Wolverine. Uh, they kind of compromised with that in the movie by having Kitty be the one who basically is the substitute for Rachel in the original story, where she develops the ability to project someone back in time. So she still pay plays an important part in the story, but she's not the main hero. Um, also, a bit of a minor difference in the original, it was Senator Kelly that was assassinated and not Dr. Trask. Um, Senator Kelly was a character in the first couple of movies, you may recall. And, yeah, apart from that one bit basic premise, it's virtually a brand new story just with the same basic idea. Honestly, I am okay with this. I know a lot of comic book purists may not like to hear this, but if they tried to do a straight adaptation of the original story, there is no fucking way that would have worked. Absolutely no way. Maybe if they did something like it back then, like back in the early 1980s, but because it, it is a very 80s story, but nowadays there's no way it would have worked. I mean, for one thing, trying to make Kitty Pride the hero would not work, mainly because of what they've done with the character in the previous movies, which is, well, not a whole lot. I mean, in the first couple of movies, she was just a background character. And in the third movie, she had a bigger role, but apart from, you know, showing off the use of her power, they didn't do a whole lot more with her. Um, and if they had, then maybe they could have actually used her as the main character and had her be the one to go back in time in the movie. But as it stands, I mean, it's... Wolverine was a much better choice. And also, if you're going to have your movie led by either Hugh Jackman or Ellen Page, which one would you choose? Because I'm going with Jackman. No disrespect to Ellen Page. I mean, she's not a bad actress. I think she gets a lot more shit than she deserves, honestly. I think she's much better than most people give her credit for. But she's not strong enough to lead this movie. She really isn't. So, and, oh, also... The fact that Mystique and her group of mutants that she uses to uh, attempt to assassinate Senator Kelly, which is not at all a covert operation by any means, they just blow a hole through the wall of the Senate building and just go in their guns blazing. The, the fact that they call themselves, in the original comic, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. I know superhero movies are usually a bit silly. Just by their very nature, they're going to be a bit silly and a bit over the top at times. But having your villains call themselves the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants... Again, maybe back in the 80s that would have worked, but in 2014, no. I mean, this, this is just storytelling 101. The evil characters don't think they're evil. And this was one of the things that the first couple of movies got right when they had Magneto form his Brotherhood of Mutants. They, that's what they called it. They didn't call it the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants because Magneto doesn't think he's evil. He thinks what he's doing is the right thing for the survival of his kind. You know, it's misguided, sure. It's a bit self-serving at times as well. But, you know, his motivation is not necessarily 
evil. It's evil from the hero's perspective, of course. But he, he's not actually standing around and saying, Oh, God, I love being evil. Look at how evil I am. <laughs> As a dramatic chord plays and thunder crashes in the background. That if they did that with the first couple of movies, then we wouldn't be on this movie by this point because the franchise would have been dead long ago. So, yeah, I'm glad that they basically created their own story for this and just took the same premise because a straight adaptation never would have worked. Now, as far as the story they did come up with, overall, I think it was pretty good. Um, it's not without its issues. The main issue is that you have so many characters in this movie and trying to give all of them adequate screen time and adequate time to tell their individual stories, something's going to get lost in there because otherwise, if, if you actually tried to give them all enough time, this movie would have been 10 hours long. So, and unfortunately, there are a lot of very interesting ideas in here that just kind of get pushed off into the background or only briefly shown or mentioned because there's just not enough time. Um, like, uh, in the past, in 1973, Magneto has been imprisoned because he apparently had a role in the JFK assassination. There's a story behind this. But the movie doesn't really have enough time to tell it. Um, and we don't hear much about what happened between Magneto and Mystique, because we saw them go off together at the end of X-Men First Class, but apparently between films they kind of went their own ways, and Mystique has been going off and trying to save as many mutants as she can from Dr. Trask's experiments, and... Um, was not able to save all of them. In fact, most of the characters that survived the last movie, apart from Magneto, Mystique, Professor X, and Beast, and, I, and Havoc is also alive, although he really only has a cameo in the movie, and that's it. The rest of them, they're all dead. Killed off screen. Um, yeah, Azazel, Emma Frost, Angel Salvador, Banshee, possibly Riptide... I don't know if he was actually shown in the movie. If he was, I missed him, but... Yeah, the movie kind of pulls an Alien 3 with them and just wipes them all out off-screen. Which is... I, I kind of understand why they did that, because this cast is already crowded, and throwing all those other characters in there would have just made it worse. But... It, it still... I kind of feel cheated. Just, you know, watching all these characters just kind of get swept under the rug. Um... Also, there's a point somewhere between films where Beast apparently develops some kind of a serum that he can inject himself with, and it covers up his beastly appearance and kind of suppresses his mutation for a while. Um, how did he come up with this, and what prompted him to do this? Because I, I would have thought that at the end of the last movie, he was finally at a point where he accepted his mutation. Apparently not, and he, or at least he figured that in order to more accurately blend in with society, this was kind of a necessary evil. I don't know. Although, come to think of it, this does actually clear up a plot hole in X2, because Dr. Hank McCoy makes a brief appearance in X2, and he is not in his beast form. This could potentially explain how he managed to do that, and yet still keep this in continuity with First Class. So... That's one plot hole fixed. Um, good luck fixing the rest of them. <laughs> Just, uh, they're, yeah, tr trying to make sense of the continuity of these movies. Oh, yeah, they've... They fucked it up big time. It, I mean, if you take out X3 and Origins Wolverine, it kind of gets better, but there's still problems. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other argument. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, really, the only member of the main cast who does get adequate time, I think, is uh, Charles Xavier, who has been using the serum that Beast developed to... Uh, because it has some sort of regeneration, regenerative capabilities that allows him to heal his spine, and suddenly he can walk again. But the side effect is it suppresses his mutation and alters his DNA, so he no longer has his telepathic ability. And throughout the film, he's 
kind of struggling between trying to regain his humanity and on the other hand accepting his identity as a mutant and the powers and responsibilities that comes with it. And uh, to his credit, James McAvoy plays this very well. And in fact, for the most part, there, there really weren't any weak points in the cast. I mean, as far as all the main players go, Ellen Page is probably the weakest actor in the bunch, and she was fine. Um, of course, Fassbender, McAvoy, and Peter Dinklage, who plays Dr. Travers, they were all fantastic. Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen are Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. You know they're going to be fine. Um, Jackman was as good as he always is. He's He owns this character. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique was once again good. Um, what's his name? Beast. Nicholas Holtz. Uh, he was fine as well. R really no weak points in there. Um, also, Evan Peters has a role in this movie as Quicksilver. And this character was a lot of fun. It's a, it's a shame he wasn't in more of the movie, but I kind of understand why he was only in a small chunk of this movie, because if they overused him, I think it would have lessened the impact that this character could have in the future. And he is going to be in the next movie, in uh, X-Men Apocalypse. And I'm looking forward to that, because I want to see more of this guy. And the character is also going to be in Age of Ultron, but played by a different actor because it's going to be present day. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to more Quicksilver. He was, uh, d during the scene where they break Magneto out of prison, there is a brilliant fight scene. It's not really much of a fight as much as it is a massacre because he just used his, his powers of super speed to basically turn the fight into slow motion. It totally takes all the tension away from it because this guy just it has so much power, there's no way any of these people can stop him. But it's so much fun to watch that it doesn't even matter. That, Although I did notice uh, one problem with that scene. While he's running around with everything else moving in slow motion, he's got some earphones on and he's listening to music while he does this. Shouldn't the music be moving in slow motion? as well while he's doing this. I mean, if, I mean, even if he somehow managed to get a portable cassette player in 1973, did they have those back then? I don't know if they did, but even if he did get one and somehow, you know, tweaked it to play faster, when you play a cassette tape faster, it raises the pitch way up. So everything he's listening to should sound like the chipmunks. So. <laughs> Something about that didn't really make sense. Also, his uh, earphones looked a bit too modern for 1973. But beyond that... Oh, also, when they meet the character for the first time, uh, but when they decide that they're going to have to bust Magneto out of prison, Wolverine says, I know a guy who can probably help. He would be a young man around now. Um, how does he know him? Because he, he never mentioned him in any of the, the other movies that I can recall. And he hasn't been in any of the other ones, so... It's like Again, there's probably a story here somewhere, but not enough time to tell it. Also, he has a Pong machine in his basement that can somehow move as fast as he can. I wasn't aware that 1970s Pong machines were overclockable. I... but whatever. These are minor nitpicks, I know. I'm just, I, I like the character, I like what they did with him, and... I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Just the little things about this, just these are, this is the shit I think about. Not much else to say about the story. Uh, the directing I thought was fine. Uh, Brian Singer is back directing for the first time since X2. I thought he did a great job with it. Uh, the movie is very well shot. I really liked the, uh, the action sequences in this. Um, Especially the final battle, which involves Magneto lifting up an entire fucking baseball stadium and basically dropping it around the White House to cut off all outside access to it. Probably would have been simpler to just move the White House to the baseball stadium instead of the other way around, but... You know what? Th this is the shit you get with superhero movies, and this is why I love these movies, because of stuff like this, so... I'm all in favor. As far as the 3D goes, uh, I did see this in 3D, and this movie was actually shot in 3D. It was not a post-conversion. 
there's nothing wrong with it. It looks okay, uh, which makes sense, given that it was shot in 3D, but Singer doesn't really do much with the 3D effect. It's just kind of there. You know, it's, it's adequate, and that's really all I can say about it. Honestly, you're probably better off saving your money on the 3D surcharge and just seeing it in 2D. One last thing to mention before signing off here. Um, I noticed in the end credits of the movie, Anna Paquin, who plays Rogue, has seventh billing. I thought this was a little bit weird because... The only part she has in this movie is the briefest of cameos at the very end. And that's it. And that struck me as odd because, you know, there, there are some other characters from the previous movies who have cameos in here. Uh, Kelsey Grammer as Beast, Thomke Janssen as uh, Jean Grey, James Marston as Cyclops. They all have cameos in this movie, and unlike Rogue, they actually have speaking cameos. And they're uncredited. And I'm thinking, is Anna Paquin just... Does she just have that good an agent that she's able to get there? Um, from what I've read online, she was originally supposed to have a much bigger role in this movie, but all of her scenes end up getting cut. So... I'm curious exactly what they had planned for her, and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing the DVD just so I can see what they cut that involved her and if they made the right decision to cut it or not. But yeah, that 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 just struck me as odd there. Um, but yeah, that's about it. I, If you are a fan of the X-Men movie franchise and you like the previous films, the good ones, and... Uh, I would definitely say this is worth seeing. If you like superhero movies, definitely worth seeing. Uh, definitely worth paying full price, I think, minus the 3D surcharge. Uh, yeah, definitely. Solid movie, solid X-Men film, and I'm looking forward to the next one. And also, there is a post credit scene. I didn't really understand what was going on because it involved a character I didn't recognize, but... It's there, so just a after the credits, stick around. You might see something cool. So that's about it. Take care. Guide us. Lead us. I don't want your future! We were supposed to protect them! You're afraid. I remember.